Welcome to Neuro Movement Revolution with Anat Benyel, where you will discover breakthrough possibilities for your life through the brain's power to change. We're so happy that you can join us in making the impossible possible. So, welcome, 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 everyone. I'm Anat Baniel, and I'm going to be having a conversation with the amazing Dr. Jill Botti Taylor, who is this incredible woman and a very, very close friend. So, <laughs> so I'm going to give the short formal bio for those of you who don't know who she is or about her. So Dr. Jill Botti-Taylor is a Harvard-trained and published neuroanatomist. In 1996, she experienced a severe hemorrhage in the left hemisphere of her brain, causing her to lose the ability to walk, talk, read, write, or recall any of her life. Her memoir, My Stroke of Insight, documenting her experience with stroke and eight years recovery, spent 63 weeks on the New York Times nonfiction bestseller list and is still routinely the number one book about stroke on Amazon. Dr. Taylor is a dynamic teacher and public speaker who loves educating all age groups, academic levels, as well as corporations about the beauty of our human brain and its ability to recover from trauma. In 2008, she gave the first TED talk that ever went viral on the internet, which now has well over 26 million views. Also, in 2008, Dr. Taylor was chosen as one of Time Magazine's 100 most influential people in the world. If it were Jill to say it, it would be the universe, and was the premier guest on Oprah Winfrey's Soul Series webcast. So now, Jill, that we got that out of the way, <laughs> I am so, 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 so happy to have you with us. Thank you. It's great to be with you. And, and how about you show, I don't have a copy of the book yet because you just got the boxes. I got boxes. Oh my God. Look at that. Whole brain living. The anatomy oh. of choice. And the four it's characters that drive our life. Yes. I, I have to say I'm, I'm thrilled with it. And it feels so good to the touch. Yes. <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> yes it's a huggable book it is it's a very huggable book yeah so Jill let's start right off and I want to ask you my question mm -hmm. that is it's a huge undertaking to write a book you have a wonderful busy life what <laughs> drove you yeah. <laughs> to take on writing a book which all in all takes what two three years yeah. Something like that. Yeah. So, so something must have been really powerful right. in your soul <laughs> that drove you to do it. Yeah. So, and that is so true because, you know, my right brain wants to go be experiential and play and, and be in the moment. And a book is not that. Uh, a book is sitting your buns down in a seat and creating something with language. It's so, so, you know, it takes both hemispheres to do it well. Um, so for me, um, you know, when I finished that TED talk, I said, we have the power to choose moment by moment who and how we want to be in the world. And um, I've had over 300,000 people write me and say, well, that's great for you. You had a stroke. How do we do it? without having a stroke. And I, I thought, you know, it was such a big question for me because I lost my left hemisphere, my logic, my rational, my reasoning, my past, my future. And I gained the experience of the present moment. And, and it was magnificent there. And then I had to come back in and rebuild the left brain skill sets. So I know how to go from right to left, but everybody was saying, how do we go from left to right without having a stroke? And so I really had to think about that for years because it wasn't natural for me. So then I was giving a presentation, uh, I was keynoting for a company and I said, you know, it's so lovely 
these days to talk about the brain in public because people are so excited to learn about their brain. And it's so fantastic that people understand the language that we have an amygdala, we have hippocampi, and we have these beautiful cerebral cortexes. But the fact of the matter is that we have two amygdala, one in each hemisphere. And there was literally an audible gasp. And I thought to myself, oh my gosh, people don't realize that the emotional system is evenly divided into the two hemispheres. So no wonder their emotions don't make any sense because they think it's all being processed in the same group of cells. But if they understood that we have two very different modules of cells processing our emotions, and then two very different groups of cells processing our thinking and our thinking in our right brain is completely different than thinking in our left brain. If they understood the anatomy of their emotional systems and reactivity and the anatomy of their two cognitive minds, it would all make so much more sense to people. So this book is essentially that it is a roadmap to understanding these four groups of cells, the um, the 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 skill sets that they each produce, and that we have a choice and we can pick and choose which of those characters we actually want to embody. And I thought, wow, what a game changer that would be for how we live our lives. And you know, if I didn't think it would help change the world, I never would have sat down and bothered. But I really believe that a little shift in how we think about ourselves and our own level of consciousness, the game changes. And if my game changes and my game in relationship to those outside of me change, and I understand my four characters and they understand their four characters, oh my gosh, we can start having really much more conscious relationships. And we have the power to choose who and how we want to be in the world. And to me, that's personal freedom. And who doesn't want that? Okay. <laughs> that was the big <laughs> matter. I think we can question. do the shortest podcast ever. Great. Thanks. No, I am teasing you. <laughs> so, <laughs> all right. So listen, a, uh, what I wrote here is, uh, is that be just before you started saying it, that what I see in your book is the bridge from moving from the academic, the cognitive, the, the really high level, uh, uh, you know, cognitive thinking to translating it through and integrating between the two sides because there has to be an integration that means they they have to somehow interconnect to to be translated into the emotional and into the feeling level yes so because your harvard days not that you didn't have emotions and you were very powerful and in the world already but your identity was much more the academic identity yes then you had this experience that took you through an eight years of this intense experience, right? And then you took all these years to say, okay, how do I, how do I sort it out? So right. people, so I built a bridge or pathways from one to the other, and then you can bounce back and forth. Yes, exactly. And as my good friend Anat always talks about, it's all about differentiation. I was going to go to the next thing. I mean, it's just, how about you interview yourself? <laughs> You're one step about me. So and it helps that I know you so well. But that's, isn't that really what it's about? It's about I, looking it's at different. all these cells and differentiating these different groups of cells and what they do. And then we can choose that. So I have a question to ask you, yeah. because as we know, the brain goes through a, a, a complete integration, right? Every, and just under 10th of a second. Yeah. So absolutely differentiation. So I, I always said, you know, we, you know, with movement, we have to differentiate and to map sensorily right. and motorically. And of course, these things are very, right. you know, married together so that we can move from being a baby that can just clench its hand fingers and open its fingers 
we moved to to being able to play the piano a few years later, right? So this massive differentiation that allows this complexity of movement. Emotions require the same thing, but they seem to be a little more elusive. They mm -hmm. seem, you know, in the, and I think your book is really addressing that in a big way, mm -hmm. you know, how to actually continue differentiating emotionally. Mm -hmm. But when I think, and maybe this, we can leave it for later, but as this evolution, do you see as we evolve like that, that there is sort of like a meta integration where you get people like the Dalai Lama, mm -hmm. you know, not that he doesn't have feelings or maybe gets a little irritated sometimes and so on, but there, it comes to a point where the whole system seems to elevate itself. Right. That yes. It, yeah. So I think that the Dalai Lama is not a good example. Because the Dalai Lama is so protected, he's allowed to live a right brain existence. He has a whole team of people who come in and run his left brain. So he doesn't have to be in a left brain at all. And that was, it's a lovely space. And that's where I was after the stroke, because all I had was the right brain and I had my mother to run my left brain world. And then once, once I recovered, I still haven't an, had an assistant to run my left brain world. So I, she would literally hand me a piece of paper on my way out the door on a, on a, on a airplane trip and say, this is where you're going. This is what you're doing. And I had no idea I had to have it on a piece of paper. And so, so I, I had somebody else doing that skill set for me. And I think that this is a lot of what happens when we have parents taking care of children who are differently abled. It's like, of course, I'm going to compensate for your what is missing in your circuitry so that your circuitry can run as it does. But at the same time, I think we have to look at how we balance that. So, but I think that what we're doing, Anat, is when you look at the evolution of humanity, okay, that's what I love about you. We're going straight to the universe and the evolution <laughs> of humanity. You know, we don't start with details, we're going big. So, when we think about the brain, uh, there were reptiles, then the mammalian came in and they had emotional tissue. And then human comes in and we add on thinking tissue. And so, what we're doing. When evolution happens, a new species comes once the new tissue gets well integrated and streamlined with the old tissue. And so the mammals were there and then we add new tissue on top. And so for the human, the new tissue on top is the thinking tissue. So what we're doing as humanity is we are we're streamlining our thoughts with our emotions in each hemisphere, our thoughts with our thoughts through that corpus callosum and our emotions through our emotions. So that ultimately, to me, the ultimate goal of, of, of human evolution is whole brain living, which is why I wrote this book. I mean, otherwise I'm just gonna go to my boat and paddleboard. You know, if I didn't think that this had the power to really change the way people think about themselves and their relationships to upgrade us, as you would say, upgrade that brain to people, the different parts of our brain are actually communicating. We give them each an identity so that they, we can be specific and honor each of them, help in that clarification. But the ultimate goal is the brain huddle where they are all communicating with one another, talking to one another and navigating our lives moment by moment. And we are then consciously choosing which of my four characters am I gonna bring out in this moment in order for my life to have peace. Love it. So, I'm going to slow it down a little bit because there are people who are listening to you and yes. I think that they might feel like they have to get an airplane to join you. So <laughs> yes, unfortunately that can't happen. Yeah. Just as long as they know, that's why the book is there and it takes people step by step by step into understanding what I just said. Okay. Okay. So right. I want to make one important, because you said it and it's so, so, so important. Yes. And again, I just was thinking that as you said it, and because I believe that there will be quite a few people that have, as you call it, differently abled or challenged children, I want to slow it down for a second and, and, and then I'll then I want to move to the four characters. Okay. So what you described about the Dalai Lama yes. is, is 
I thought it's like being a child with good parents and exactly. children are very right brained, very, very right brained and the evolution of thinking and the magical thinking, you know, the whole sta stages that happen there. So, so, and under good conditions, it's a blissful ex existence. Yes. A lot of children, unfortunately, do not have a blissful childhood, but under good conditions, it's a blissful existence. You, you're not accountable. You don't have to know where you're going. You, Somebody is going to make sure you're not going to run into the middle of the road and give you food, etc. And with children with special needs, one of the big challenges, and I just want to say that, you said to balance it. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't even call to balance. I, I, that's, I would look for every opportunity to allow for the child a moment where they are in charge and accountable for what they do within their field of ability, with the scope of ability and safety. Yes. So as long as they are safe. Yes. And what happens is in general, when we start taking care of another person, I just experienced it with my brilliant 31 year old daughter two days ago. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> She's looking to buy a house. Yeah. And of course, the market is crazy. And I'm starting to tell her, oh, you, you should do this. And it says, Mom, stop. She said, I am 31 years old. I know and here I am. <laughs> and she said, I'm a lawyer. I know how to take care of my life. <laughs> So, and I looked at myself and I said, I have so much more compassion for the parents we work with yeah. that I, I, I coach them where to find those opportunities. And then the children start thriving Yes, because in an interesting way, the nervous system to be healthy, we need mm -hmm. to have the pressure enough of the demand. If we don't have enough of the demand, actually we start sort of atrophying in a certain way. Yeah. So now, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. So now, would you say what the four characters are? Yes. Then maybe say a few words about each character. So people who are listening and nobody except a few privileged people have read the book yet. Yes. <laughs> so, so, um, so that they have a more connection to what you're yes. talking about. Have you named your four characters or not? No. Okay, well, you're going to get two today. Okay, so character, okay, so think about it as two emotional brains and two thinking brains. And if you take a human brain and you open it up like this, we end up with in the left brain, left thinking, character one, left emotion, character two, right emotion, character three, and right emotion, character four. Okay, so let's start with character one. Character one is that rational part of our brain that organizes our life. It is a absolutely necessary character for us to be able to function efficiently. It has language, it communicates with language. It thinks it by methodically, it likes to create order. It thrives in hierarchy. It knows where it is on above and below. Am I where on everything, whether it's uh, financial, whether it's uh, uh, socially, wherever we are, we know that hierarchy. So it creates, it's a fantastic part of who, who we are. For me, I call that Helen. Helen goes to work. She's hell on wheels. She gets it done. You know, she goes to the office. She holds my body in a certain way. She has a certain tone. She gets that furrow in the brow. She's organized. If you're going to call and, and my friends uh, call and Helen picks up, they say, oh, hello, Helen. Can you call me later when, you know, you're no longer in the office? And it's like, yes, I will do that. So there, it's a structured, organized part of ourselves. So this is a part that, that we have to have in order to be efficient in the external world. If we are a perfectionist, it is our character one. If we like to control people, places, or things, it is our character one. So that's character one. And um, it's a magnificent part of ourselves that likes to have control. It likes to uh, be the boss inside of most of us. Uh, it's the monkey mind that is constantly talking to us. Um, it is uh, it our, our discipline and it get, is punctual and it gets us to places on time. Character one. I'm not Beautiful. Can you hear your character one. Uh, Frida. Frida. Yes. 
We'll call her Frida. Sounds pretty disciplined to me. <laughs> All right. So you're Helen and my Frida. We work together. Now, so character number two is our... Now, let me Gio, say... Jill, would you recommend for people already to try that are listening to put down at least a temporary name for yes. their character one? Yes. I encourage everybody, and I don't name everybody's character one. I call it character one because... These names are going need to be unique to ourselves. Yeah, yeah no, no. What I'm saying, everybody, yes. so there are a few hundred people listening. Yes. They can all choose their own name. Parallel. Absolutely. I encourage them to write down their character one. Give that part of you a name. The part that goes to work and gets it done. Give that part of you a name. In fact, Neil, you're in control here, right? Can, can people chat some of their character ones to us? And they can't, I'm afraid. I've um, disabled the chat and I can't figure out how to re-able it. But if I do, I okay. will. They can okay. raise their hand though. Okay. Okay. So um, so then we'll go back and we'll we'll do that if once we do the four characters. How's that sound? Good. If if you can figure it out. Yeah. Okay. So character, so when you think about that that brain, when I lost the left hemisphere, I lost my past and my future. I lost my language and my relationship with the external world. I had no idea what a mother was, much less who my mother was. I knew nothing about the external world. I became infantile. So the left brain is about the past and the future and our external world. The right is about the present moment. So what that means is that Helen is good at looking back and remembering what I had for breakfast. And my, my emotional character too, if I didn't like what I had for breakfast, She's going to remember it. Okay. So the emotion of our character too is all the emotion and pain from our past. It's all of our trauma. It's our, um, our unhealthy coping skills, as well as our healthy coping skills. But the tissue in there is also our craving tissue. So whatever addictions or trauma we may have had, have had is in the past. It is in that character too. So character two, if I'm going to feel guilty about something, it's about something from the past. If I'm going to feel shame about something I did, it's something I did in the past. If I'm holding a resentment, I'm holding a resentment from something that happened in the past. And then I can project that as to fear in the future. So our little character two is not a very happy little character. And if we are happy, it is also our character too, but our character too is happy based on what is happening in the external world and the circumstances. I am happy that I am talking to you today. I am happy because um, uh, the weather is good. I'm happy because someone is loving me. But this part of us is all of our pain from our past. So I call my little pain from the past, Abby, which is short for um, abandoned. And mm -hmm. I believe that the moment I was ejected from my mother's womb, where I was completely in the present, I was completely enveloped in love and I was a part of a heartbeat and I was, I was something. And then boom, I come out into the real world. And all of a sudden my sensory systems are accosted with lights, my sounds with my ears with sounds. I'm being poked and prodded and it's the temperature of the room. And it's like, ah, why do you think we scream when we're born? Why wouldn't we? We just got abandoned from the womb. So I call her Abby and my little Abby. I just love the pieces because I have to because she's a part of who I am. And little Abby is designed to push away from anything that I may see as uh, painful or, or threatening based on my past experience. So if I got bit by a dog a few years ago, then I'm remembering that in my little Abby. And then I see another dog and now I start feeling anxious and anxiety and alarm, alarm, alert, alert, my emotional reactivity, because I'm afraid that that dog is now going to bite me. So that's my character one and my character two, Abby. Tell me about your little character two, Abby. What do you have? Do, did you give her a name? Yeah, Sabrina. Sabrina. And I stole your idea from... Um, about Abby abandoned. So in Hebrew, Sevel is suffering. Ah. Sabrina, Sevel. Ah. I just kind of. Perfect. Yeah. 
because it is, this is where we suffer. And we suffer because emotionally, we have a preconceived idea of what we want reality to be instead of actually being good with what reality is. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's where suffering comes from. Okay, character number three is the emotion of the present moment. Character three, the emotion of the right brain. And that has no preconceived idea of anything. And it is just in the present moment is, is excited and enthusiastic and it's interested and it's explosive and it's uh, creative because there's no right and wrong because all the judgment and right and wrong is in the left hemisphere. So it's enthusiastic and it is experiential. It wants to, to experience. It wants to uh, have an adrenaline rush. It wants to jump off a cliff and dive into the water. It wants to fly in the sky and, and it wants to go fast and, and it wants to, it wants to, and it wants to play and it wants to play with others because there is no boundary. The left brain actually defines the boundaries of where we begin and where we end. And so to the right brain, there is no boundary. So I am as big as the universe and I can fly. So I want to jump off that cliff and fly through the air, or I want to go hang gliding. And I want you to come too, because it's all collective whole. It likes to play with other people and it's the tribal connection of us. So it's, it's our togetherness and our, it's loving and it's open and expansive and, and connected with others. And it's, it's, nurturing and it's wonderful. It's this wonderful, enthusiastic part of ourselves that wants to go and play. Love it. And what part of you is that? Uh, it's my left brain that's choosing the name, so I might change them eventually, but exactly. <laughs> but, that's fair. Yeah, but I think uh, I don't like the sound of the word. Simcha is a name in Hebrew, which means uh, happiness or joy. Simhai. I like Simhai. My little friend Simhai. S-I-M-C-H-A. C-H-A. Simcha. Simcha. So mine's Pigpen. So Pigpen's going to come in because, you know, Pigpen in the Schulz cartoon, Pigpen's the one who is always in a dust storm. Yes. Right? Pigpen is always a mess. And so so Pigpen wants to come and say, Simcha. <laughs> and after a while i'll get it right and then you'll say no, no don't worry don't worry <laughs> see, don't have, see, we, have, we have to to help you i'll give you some kind you know motor sensory experiences yeah. and differentiate a few you know a few million new connections and yes yes yeah. yeah okay well um uh, i'm game to work on that Okay. <laughs> so, okay. So that's, that's the emotion of our right here, right now, right brain. And then character four is the thinking tissue of our right brain. And when you consider that when we're born, when, even before we're born, when we're conceived, we are one egg and we are one egg and one sperm DNA weaving together. So we become a mighty zygote single cell. Well, that single cell is filled with energy and it comes from the energy from the womb and from everything else that is around us, right? So there's energy in that cell. And that cell is going to multiply itself at a rate of 250,000 cells per second, not per minute, per second. And so it's going to multiply and divide, multiply and divide, multiply and divide. You're going to have cells be differentiated into being liver cells or into heart cells or into brain cells or into all the cells, but they multiply, 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 multiply. And the energy of that entity is the energy of that character four. So the energy, by the time we grow and we are born, we are connected to all that is. And we are connected to all that is through that consciousness of that character four. So if we are trying to meditate in order to find our peace and our connection to a higher power or an infinite being or, or the force or God or Allah or whatever you want to call that, we are wired at the level of our character four to be connected to that 
experience and to that energy consciousness. So it's a magnificently wise and big picture, open and expansive, completely all loving, all encompassing consciousness inside of ourselves. And so I call that part of myself queen toad queen, because she is a queen of the universe as we all are. And I call her toad because she's a bit goofy and I live on a boat, which I consider my lily pad. <laughs> you know, so I live out with nature and it's just a beautiful, beautiful part of who we are. Your name, ma'am? Well, I, I'm interesting. I'm going to these Hebrew names. I, it's not the name of a person, but the, the, I, I have to think it more, but Neshama, Neshama. Okay, so the word is neshama. Neshama. Neshama, and it's a, a soul, spirit, a, yeah. a breath. Yeah, so, oh, perfect. Yeah. Perfect, I love that. <sighs> so the point is we are all four of these at an anatomical level. So, so when you look at the title of the book, it's the anatomy of choice. So we make bad choices all the time because we're just in our reactivity. We're in our fear. We're, uh, uh, we're in our anxiety. We're in our alarm, alarm, alert, alert. And isn't it lovely that we have all of these, each of these characters so that when I am caught in my emotion and my anxiety, I know that that emotion is only going to run for less than 90 seconds. Okay, so can I can I actually yes. a, a pose a question that I was just, it's amazing, Jill, how, how we operate. I mean, it's just like <laughs> second and you're there and I, <laughs> you know, but I'd like to, to pace it a little bit. So this is magnificent. And the whole anatomy uh, uh, you, you know, you studied my work and you know that my teacher was Feldenkrais. And one of the things that he did, he looked at the development from the conception on and he looked at the separation into three layers. And he looked, for example, at people's skin quality hmm. to judge it, on some level the quality of the brain tissue. Hmm. He, he, he he lived in that world of the integration of structure and function. Yeah, yes. And there's a book about that, a well-known book on, on, on the, what's the name of the book, Neil? On, on, um, it was written many years ago. Uh, it is about structure and function. Okay. Uh, but I'll come up with an accurate name in a minute. Yes. I, I don't have it with On me. growth and form? On, 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 on growth and form. Okay. I'll the relationship, the intimate, intimate, intimate relationship between growth and form, and I already translated it to structure and function. It's like I mean, breath of life. Yeah, I mean, it's 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 this it's it's it's, it's all it's all one. It's yeah. all it's all one with a lot of parts that is extremely right. extremely complex that have to learn to work. To, they always work together. The question is, how are they working together? So now. You, you gave the four characters, which is gorgeous. And I love that inter, intimate, evol, you know, joint evolution of these two aspects. Um, so the question, my question that I'm going to ask, and I was going to start it from the emotional uh, brain, probably the left side emotional brain in the way you describe it. When we get into like somebody does something and we get really upset or very hurt or frightened, it has the quality of dominating our whole being. <laughs> and it has the quality of very tends to have the quality of being very convincing yes. that it's really so. Yes. It's really the end of the world or it's the end of the relationship. Powerful. Yes. Yeah. At that moment, yes. what is like a lifeline yes. or, or a rope or how in the midst of that very convincing moment yes. to do a, something different, like to know that it is just 
a yeah. moment and a character. Yes. Uh, so what would you say about that? How to how to to have a you know an yeah. out? Yeah, it's right. How how do you do that? How do you hit the stop button? Yeah. Um, and and you, first you have to become aware of it. And and when two when our character two comes online, it is powerful and it is embodying and it is uh, usually a rageful or a fearful, but it's a powerful. So it's and the adrenaline. It's a whole. It's the total adrenaline. What does it feel like inside of your body? And then and then what you know? There's a physiological response right back to the structure function and the form and the growth. What, they happen simultaneously. So there is a body posture that happens in our different emotions, because, um, you know, uh, I have a thought, uh, and the thought stimulates my anger and my anger stimulates a physiological response, which goes to my brain and says, dump nor adrenaline into my body. It floods through me. I move into rage or I move into fear, but I move into attack or I move into flee, whatever my automatic system says when I'm in my sympathetic nervous system of surge, surge, alarm, alarm, alert, alert. But from the moment I think the thought until I run that physiological response, the, the noradrenaline floods through me and flushes out of me takes less than 90 seconds. Just knowing that means that if I'm feeling it, because I feel it, my shoulders instantly go up. My chest gets gets um, tighter, which means my breath is more shallow. I, I get that furrow in my brow. I, I, I want to I wanna attack. I'm an attacker. Oh, sorry, but it's true. Um, <laughs> and I was trained that way as an infant or as a child, but in relationship to my brothers who it was like, you fight for your life or you, you can't outrun them, you know? <laughs> So anyway, so, so there's a physiological attack and it's like, as soon as I become aware that my two has been triggered and you can train yourself to recognize the amperage up as it starts flooding through you, it's like two's on, it's like Abby's in. As soon as I know Abby's in, I know it's going to take less than 90 seconds for that to run its course. I know I have a thinking character one. Character one, can, I know, is back there saying, are we safe? What can we do to make us safe? Are we physically safe? Char that's character one. She's going to fix it. That's what she does. She comes in and fixes the job. Character four is observing character two have this surge and going, we got gotcha. you. We love you. We're here. We got you. You're not alone. We hear you. We love you. We are a team. As soon as you allow your consciousness to shift, it's like when you go into character two, all the energy in the brain goes, and that's what you become. But it's just energy and it's just cells performing their function. So just being aware that you have a one allows some energy to shift. Character one, take a look around. Are we safe? Do you need to do something to fix it, to make us safe? Character four is always there. Allow that love. I know I know the universe has me. I know the universe has me and that's what I go to. And as soon as I do that, my energy starts to go into my little four. And then I've got this really powerful character three pig pen and she is my salvation for play. And it's like, if I... I have a choice. I can, I can move right in and I can get my motor to my mouth going and I can yang, 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 and I can just perpetuate the power of that energy in that character too. Or I can say to myself, I don't want to fight today. I don't want to do this. So I've been triggered, but I don't have to stay here. I can go take a walk. I can go to nature. I can go to my art space. I can call a friend and I can allow other parts of my energy. It's just knowing that I have this opportunity is my power to make a better choice. Now, am I going to make a better choice? Probably most of the time. Because I know I have a choice to go to one, I have a choice to go to four, I have a choice to go to three, or I have a choice to just chew this bone and be my ugliest self and spew that out into the world. Those are my choices. So the power of the anatomy of choice is I have other options when that too gets triggered. Gorgeous. It's amazing. It's gorgeous. 
It's amazing. It's free. It's, it's freedom. It's always ends freedom. And I'm going to pop it back to the concept of differentiation. So I when love. you love that, good. <laughs> you love me. So you love that. I love you. I and love I you too. Differentiation. Yes. <laughs> My four loves you, my one loves you, my three loves you, and my two, my two even loves you because my two knows you're two. Oh, okay. You know, and we, we love one another. I mean, yes. we just, I mean yes. is, isn't that the beauty of, of a magnificent friendship when yes. my four embrace your four? I'm not here to judge you or to shame you or to, to guilt you or to resent you or to hold anything against you. I'm here. I do believe our number one job is to love one another. Absolutely. And, character for. and yeah. we, we, that's who we are and that's what we do. And so yeah. I so value all of you who are listening. Yes, there's a big love fest here. Yes. Uh, <laughs> well, that's a good thing, a, you know, but you know, for me, my whole work is just love. And you know, that. Love. It's just I mean, there's love. nothing yeah. like your face when you're working. Yeah. You evolve, you, you, everything evaporates for you except the present moment and the love of observing and trying. Yeah, exactly. And trying, exactly. you know, and I love that. Yeah. 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 So, oh my goodness, I was going to say something. <laughs> you, you you washed me with this love and now I'm just kind of like, I know, character I'm one, you know, she now. takes this. I'm it? number three. <laughs> interview, what interview? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Oh, this is just fantastic. I had this wonderful question. Oh, differentiation. Ah, character so, one, back online. Yeah, back online. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so, so, you know, so when I want to, let's say again, the, the, I, I see a piano, I see somebody playing, but my fingers move together. That's all they know. Or if somebody had a stroke and all of a sudden the fingers move together, it's loss of differentiation, either by loss of tissue or sometimes because of the trauma, there's actually a, a mega different a, a, a inhibition. So the things don't move. So they're, un, so they're undifferentiated. And the way to get basically what I hear you saying to to improve our well-being, our freedom, is as we differentiate through those understanding and self-observation of the four characters, we differentiate all all of them. Yes. But we start giving a, a, a more priority or more space yes. to number three and four and get, let it, that's my Dalai Lama part, that they give it more say in how number one and number two operate. Yes. And number one can then differentiate to include yes. the unconscious, the feeling self, the, the sensing self. So you came from academia, it'll be very familiar to you that one can become really smart and bright and publish papers, but be dissociated from three and four. And it's sort of like not very useful right. yes. for living people. Yes. And what I see your whole brain living book does is it infuses the brilliance, the, the knowledge, the, the amazing knowledge that humans have acquired and that you have in, within you to be living, living knowledge, living ability. I mean, it gives us access to it into yes. our life and into our daily life. Exactly. It gives access to it. Because yeah, but it also we, evolves it. Exactly. Because we, we have all four. Why wouldn't we use all four? Yeah. And unfortunately, we're in a society that is so skewed to the value structure of the left brain, the left thinking brain, that the left thinking brain wants to run the show and control everything and be in control. But the problem is that's our stress circuitry. Now, it's important to have that, but we are living beings. We are not machines that you turn it on and you leave it on for three years until it dies right? We are living beings. And as living beings, we have a push 
And then we have to have a pause. We have to reset and we have to reorganize. We have to flush the system and then we have, we can have energy again. And then we have to have the pause, which is why we sleep in order to pause so that all the garbage and waste from all these 50 trillion beautiful cells that make up our being have the opportunity to get freshened up again. Yeah. We're a biological system, biological systems. You have some, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the negative feedback system is how we function. I get hungry. I eat. I'm not hungry anymore. If I, if I have a positive feedback, I'm hungry. I eat. I got food. I want more food. I want more food. I want more food. I want more food. And that's what that left brain is doing. I want more. 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 And you better let me have more because otherwise you're bad and you're wrong. And then I'm not, and then I'm not going to be happy. And if I'm not happy, you had not be happy either. Right. Cause misery <laughs> company. Right. But, and, and, and so it's your fault. Yeah. But we have to have the pause and the pause is, forget the push, get out of the, the left brain, get out of the past, get out of the future, come to the get out of some concept that has nothing to do with anything anywhere and come and look at your life. Life is right here. Love is right here. It's not in the past. It's not in the future. Prayer is right here, right now. Meditation is right here, right now. Access to play and experiential is right here, right now. We are biologically programmed to be all four of these characters. And isn't it lovely that getting to know them, identifying them gives us the, the ability to strengthen each of them so that when that little two starts going on, I've got three other options to pick from. Yeah. So I, I, I want to say a few things about what you said and see what you think about that. Okay. Yeah. So let's start with the character two. Another, another aspect to character two, and tell me what you think about it, that I can think about is that it picks up important information. What it does with it can be a problem. But you walk, <laughs> you, you walk into a room, yeah. you know, I'll never forget early on in my career, I worked with this woman that was in a horrible car accident. And, you know, and she was, uh, I don't know, two, three years past that. And, and she, uh, and she told me what happened. So she uh, was walking on a, on a sidewalk or something with her two teenage sons. And a car was coming, you know, towards them. And she had the feeling that the car is going to run them over. And it was, so she jumped and pushed her boys away and the car hit her. Now, the, it's, the car was not already going towards her when, when that happened. It's a pretty horrible, you know, example. But character two picked it up. Yeah. It's, it's the two that senses stuff that oftentimes is pre, pre-structured, irrational, can't be justified, and, is, so, and that's an example of danger. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that I, I see sometimes when I work with people and also seeing with myself is to listen sort of to honor but to take over that's what you mean then move to another part move to so yeah. that's how i hear it so, so it's not like oh those things come in right you know you yes. see me work i mean i you, you we know we pick up yes. and that's i think for for good or for bad but especially for bad character two is excellent in oh. recognizing when something is off yes and, and that is very, very important to have. The yes. question is, oh, what do absolutely. you do with it? Well, well, that's you're absolutely right, except it's not just character two that is observing and picking up data, it's character three. Our emotion, we have two alarm, alarm, alert systems. One yeah. is right here, right now. So when she intuitively pictured, this is danger action, Yes, that was, her, that was the intuition of her big picture character four coming in. It was character three knowing we have to act quickly and we're going to act. And character two also in and probably character one saying, what do I do? 
safety over there, go there, fix, fix this immediate problem. So it's really that moment is a whole explosion. Um, but then, you know, it's it, the, a huge point here is that e sensory systems coming in and it's going first to the emotional systems. So that's alarm, alarm, alert, alert. Am I safe? Am I not safe? Do I want more of that? Do I want less of that? Am I, am I, do I, am I repelled or am I attracted? Mm -hmm. So we are feeling creatures. We are feeling creatures who then think, not thinking creatures that feel. So that little character too, even though I loved what you said, it picks up important information. What it does with it can be a problem. <laughs> Because it's it, the cells of our emotions never mature. They are in position and communicating by the time we're born. So I'm born and I'm having an experience and I'm wailing and I'm having an experience and I'm wailing. And so they're organized. But the thinking brain cells, even though those cells have taken position, they have not interconnected yet. So that's why the brain continues to grow as, as time goes, because those neurons then start to interconnect with one another and catch in. So you're absolutely right. We are feeling creatures who think, not thinking creatures who feel. And just knowing that about ourselves says we have to honor. Now, yeah, you know, the price I pay for having my character too is that, that explosive uh, alarm, alarm, alert, alert, but it's that explosive alarm, alarm, alert, alert in both two and three that saves my life a million times in my lifetime. Yeah. It's critically important and it needs to be loved. I mean, we, you know, how many people say, oh, you know, they go to therapy and they say, can you just cut that part of me out, you know, or oh, they no. Say, no, you'd be dead in five seconds. It will, it's exactly, it is precious and it is beautiful and it wails and it screams because it's in pain and it's in pain because what is out there isn't matching what it needs in order to feel peace. And it's just an infantile part of ourselves and we deserve to love ourselves by our one, our four and our three. And our two deserves to be loved by others. Now, we don't want to spend a lot of time with somebody's character too, but when they do show up, it, just looking at that character too and knowing, honey, I feel you, I, I hear you. What, what do you need? What do you, would you, what do you need me to say? What do you need me to love you? Do you want ice cream? Do you just want to scream and cry and I'll scream and cry with you? What do you need? And be present for that part. And then it's like little two says, oh, okay, I, I, I'm, I'm not alone. I, I like this. This is good. Okay, let's go play with number three. Wonderful. Yeah. So uh, we don't, I mean, are you okay going a little bit past the hour? Yes, if you are. I am. And, you know, people can stay or if they have to leave, they can come back later or whatever and listen to it later. So uh, uh, for those of you who are not going to stay, you know, past the hour, I want you to show your book again. And can it be pre-ordered on Amazon? Yes, it's currently, if you go to Amazon and just plug in uh, Whole Brain Living, Jill or Taylor or Jill Bolte Taylor, uh, a page will come up and we can pre-order. Um, and now they all come out on May 11th. So, I, I mean, I just got mine yesterday and it's like, and it's beautiful and it feels it's silky. And then the whole brain living is raised. And so I can see yeah, that it's, it's experientially, it's beautiful. So I really, and look at that neuronal network. It's three dimensional on top. Yes. And, and it's, I, th I think, I truly believe that I came back from that stroke to write this material. Wonderful. The only way I ever would have learned it, nobody would ever be able to write this particular book if they didn't understand the brain and lost half of theirs and then had to rebuild and yeah. blah, blah, blah. So I truly believe this is my gift to yeah. the world. Wonderful. Well, it's certainly a huge, huge gift. And I'm sure you'll keep giving gifts for many, many more years. I don't think it's the final you gift. You still just want to go paddleboard. I know. So what? <laughs> <laughs> you pedal board and then you have a calling and you pedal board and then you have a calling, you know, it's yeah, that's true. Yeah. 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 The push in the pool, isn't it? It's the push in the pool. Yeah. That was the potion. And uh, now yeah. I need that pause. So yeah. 
Yeah. And I want to come back to the thing about the brain we sleep because, you know, the, there's the whole vacuum cleaning and cleansing of the brain and all the debris that happens during waking hours. Yes. And then I'm going to say something that, of course, is so obvious to you. A huge amount of building also happens during sleep. Yes. I mean... Yes. Uh, when I when I studied, you know, statistics and math, and I had a problem to solve, and I worked with it and worked with it. I, I had to start first of all working with it, and I couldn't solve it. I went and slept for fifteen minutes, yeah. and I wake up and I had the solution, or I slept the night and I woke up and I just had the solution. Somebody did some work during the sleep. Sorted and sorted and building. You're absolutely right. Yeah. So so there's the cleanse, but there's a. At my experience, is sleep is such a generative it doesn't have constraints of space and time right and so much can happen yeah. during sleep and we can even train ourselves to trust it then more even happens it's like i go like oh give me a night or two to sleep on it and i'll, I'll come back to you right you yes. know so i just wanted to add that to the miraculousness the magic of the the working of the brain yeah. Well, you know, what it does is when you think about input, 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 trillions of bits of data moment by moment for these cells. I mean, these are just little cells processing our reality, giving us the perception that we're real and that we have our three dimensional thing and can process a three dimensional world beyond us that we are going to interact with. And it kind of fools us into forgetting the idea that we're mortal. And boom, we could be gone like that because that's a very unpleasant thought for a little too, right? I don't want to spend my time thinking, well, I could be gone in an instant, but it's true. So, so it's this magnificent processing. And then we go to sleep. Well, they're busy. They're busy. The waste gets taken out and they start moving into these waveforms, these big waveforms where they're all kind of integrating and communicating and saying, okay, now we got all these bits of data. Now let's look at the big picture and put it together. So what do we really know? Because now we can take the time to put things in process and kind of organize it so that we are constructing new thoughts and ideas and new patterns of knowledge knowing. And what is that number that you give me about how many new synaptic connections we can make? 1.8 million new connections per second when we are in a learning uh, estimated. 1.8 million per second when, per we, second when what I call when you have your learning switch on, the organic learning switch on. And what that means is that the neurons in there are all doing their neuroplasticity and rearranging their network. So yes. when you think about what's a really smart brain, a really smart brain isn't a big brain. It, it's because it, you can have a big brain with a bunch of cells that aren't talking to one another, which means none of them know what the other ones know. So what do we really know? But if you've got a, a brain where all the cells are interconnected and communicating, bam, they have access to all this information. Absolutely. And, and but, but what they do when you really use the brain in the way you're talking about my understanding is it also keeps differentiating all the time. So yeah. when I was asked, what's the, what's the basis for vitality? I said, the process of differentiation in yeah. the brain yeah. on all aspects, emotional, cognitive, and so on. And yeah. then how do you activate the process? So your book is giving very, very exciting ways to start yeah. observing, becoming, using awareness, using intentionality to know and to feel and yeah. to do something with it. So, yeah. Now, uh, what I'd like to do is take uh, just a few minutes if you're open to it. We've gotten a, a couple or so questions for, I don't know if we can do all of them, if we got more in the meanwhile, but I told Neil to select maybe one or two questions that he thinks would fit. That'd be fun. Okay. And we've had some come up uh, during the call. And also there's somebody with her hand up in the, in the meeting. Yeah. Well, I, I would, would like you to know what the question is before it comes. That's Jill's request. Yeah. Okay. It's quicker and easier. So um, a question from Robin, who is on the or was on the call earlier. I'm just going to make sure they're still here. Um, yes. My nervous system has felt very overwhelmed since getting sober five years ago. I sense that my nervous system is on fire and learning to rewire and calm itself. This has been very tiring. 
what tools can help me help my nervous system? That is a beautiful, beautiful question. So that system was probably on when you were younger and you started using alcohol as the coping method. And so that system then got trained. When I do this, when I stimulate anxiety, I get a hit of alcohol and alcohol then kind of numbs and calms the whole system down. Take away the alcohol and now I still have the anxiety. So I think the, the most important thing to recognize is that anxiety is a group of cells inside of your brain. And when you're feeling that anxious and like your nervous system is on fire, on fire, and the stress of the alarm, alarm, and you're running your adrenals, so you're flooding, 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 is to purposefully choose other parts of, of your brain to engage and get that focus pure. And this is one of, one of the, it's a great question for why do we even want to know our four characters? Figure out which of your four characters does that anxiety and energy stimulate and run in a positive way, and which ones can distract you away from it in order to pull that energy away. And my guess is that either your character three or your character four, allowing yourself to go and change your breathing and to purposely work that circuitry that's on overdrive overload, pay attention to the patterns of what stimulates it and what, what calms it, what foods stimulate it, what foods calm it, which relationships stimulate it, which relationships calm it, but really get to know that circuitry because that's a group of cells. And as soon as you're willing to look at that alarm and that stress and that drive and that anxiety or that fear or whatever, eh, pay attention to other parts of your brain and the external world and what fuels it and what dissipates it. That's where I would begin. Awareness is the first step for any kind of healing like that. Wonderful. Uh, Neil, is there another question you think would be good to ask right now and then? Absolutely. Um, so here's another question. This one is coming from Facebook. Lauren says, great info. What about those that have suffered brain damage, stroke, MS, etc., who get stuck in character two? emotions and fear. It's hard to get out of that. It's always hard to get out of character too. Um, but, you know, people come to me and they say, Jill, you lost half your mind. You fell off the Harvard ladder and look at you. You're still happy. What, why, what, what, why, what on earth are you happy about? And I'm happy for what I have and I'm happy for my life. And I live my life in a state of gratitude and if anybody ever wants to turn on their character four, move into your state of gratitude. What are you grateful for? I'm grateful that I did not die that day. I'm grateful that I have lungs that allow me to breathe. I'm grateful that my eyes and my ears still work. I'm grateful that my legs came back and that my arm came back and that certain circuits in my brain came back. But whether or not they came back, I was grateful that I did not die that day and I still had the possibility. So that's my character four. My character three was still experiencing joy. I had people in my life who loved me. I had people in my life who tended to me during my greatest vulnerability and time of need. I had people who were there for me, who are around me, who chose to help me. And my character one, bless her, she ended up coming back online. So as I tried to recover and I started gaining certain things, I celebrated that I was capable of still being alive and regaining those abilities. I, I never focused on woe is me. Oh my God, I fell off the Harvard ladder. I'm, I'm worthless. I have no value anymore. People are going to think, oh, poor Jill. I didn't go there and I didn't do that because that wasn't the life I wanted to live. And so I learned 
learned that is not the circuitry I'm going to fuel. And the thing about the brain is whatever we focus on, that circuit runs and that circuit grows in its own power to start running on automatic. So if somebody has habitually hooked into their character to help them realize they have other circuits inside of their brain and they can strengthen those other three characters to allow themselves to come out and have more gratitude and more joy and more grace and more productivity in the, in their lives. Well, Jill, I think just your, your emotional. So I get emotional because I don't know how not to do that, yeah. but so we can cry together during the interview. That's okay. <laughs> we have both characters and they're strong and we love them. Yeah. So, but I think by a, allowing yourself, because you have a very strong character one and you can really activate it anytime you want and you allow yourself, your whole self to show up in the interview yeah. and you allow this emotional part of yourself but the the you know the well emotional part of yourself you're getting emotional was not a negative thing i think it's a magnificent demonstration or manifestation Mm -hmm. of the whole brain living Mm -hmm. because throughout throughout the you are living with your whole brain and I don't know if it's a good thing to say or not, but when you said you fell off the Harvard ladder, I, I went like, thank God, look where you are. And I think, I mean, it's like, really? I mean, you, you, you are what you, you're expansive as the universe and you're as human and, and the, as anyone can be. Thank you. And thank you so much for coming on this thing and i want if want you to give you an opportunity if there's one thing you want to say to people that are listening to us right now what do you want to send people off with our number one job is to love one another period we're here to love one another and i can let your behavior or your tone or the way you look at me or all these other reasons be a reason why I'm going to push away with my two and say, no, no, no. But in the big picture on our death, on our deathbed, character one will close out from the world. Character two will snuggle down. Character three will dissipate and character four will be the ride we take out. We are here to love one another. So I encourage people to learn about each of the characters so you can strengthen them inside of yourself. And as soon as you start strengthening them inside of yourself, you can start seeing in other people, oh, she's in her one. Okay, she doesn't want me to interrupt her. I get that. So I either come in as a one to your one or whatever, but we start reading one another and we start looking and interacting with one another more lovingly. And I truly believe that's what we're here for. So thank you, Anat, for letting me be with you. As you know, all four of my adore all four of you. And for all of those of you who are here with us today, we are beautiful. We are this magnificent collection of cells and, and, you know, enjoy, enjoy it, celebrate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jill. And thank you, Neil, for being in the Neil, background and making love your four too. I spoke over you. What did you say? Oh, I, I said, said yes, Neil, we love your four too. Thank you. <laughs> yes. I love all your parts. <laughs> Shall I just uh, let everybody uh, show their video so they can yes, I'd love oh, yeah, to I say goodbye? To everybody. That'd yeah. be great. So now everybody should be able to show their video. There we go. Lovely. Yeah. I love it. Yeah, wonderful seeing all of you guys. You're beautiful. Did you have a good time? Wave your hand if you had a good time. And if you learned, show us your, yeah, wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. Perfect. Perfect, perfect. Okay. Love you guys. I know a lot of you that are on. And thank you again, Jill. You disappeared. I don't see you anymore. I don't know where you are. That's but I'm looking at everybody. Hi, everybody. <laughs> Hi, everybody. 
Thank you for being here today. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you for joining us on Neuro Movement Revolution with Anab Benyel. You will find all of our podcasts and additional resources on our website at www.anatbenielmethod.com. You can also subscribe to this podcast for free on iTunes, iHeartRadio, Spotify, Google Play, Stitcher, and TuneIn. We look forward to seeing you online for our next Neuro Movement Revolution.